Hello and welcome to the No Heroes podcast. I'm your host, Christopher Lawrence. I am super, super psyched today because I have with me for my guest, Sam Dyer. And Sam is the creative director at the phenomenal Bitmap Books, who publish uh, incredibly, incredibly high quality retro gaming books, uh, such as Ghost Straight, The Ultimate Guide to Scratch Going Beat 'em Ups, The Games That Weren't, Metal Slug, The Ultimate History. The Art of Point and Click Adventure Games, which is my personal favorite, and hopefully we'll, we'll spend a little time on that and more. Sam, thank you so much again for, for coming on and doing this. Thank you for the very kind intro. Nice to be here. Um, so let's start off with a little bit of your background. Um, can you maybe give me uh, a bit of your professional background first, and then maybe we'll get into a little bit of your personal gaming background? Yeah, sure. So I'm a graphic designer by trade. So I went to art college um, and then university um, studied graphic design and then spent 10 years in uh, working for various brand and design agencies in obviously in the United Kingdom which you can probably tell from from my accent in uh, in London working with some amazing people uh, but very much sort of working for corporate clients um, sort of big and small and charities and that's kind of what I did for, yeah, as I said, about sort of 10 years, and I still do a little bit of now. Okay, and then uh, let me ask you a little bit about your gaming background, and then we'll see kind of how those things ended up converging. Um, are, first of all, are you a big gamer? I would imagine so. Yeah, I don't get as much time as I did, obviously, you know, when I was, when I was younger, right. um, with children and with and work. But no, I, yeah, I've ever since I was, I don't know the exact date, but how old I was, I think I was about eight, eight or nine, I've been pretty much hooked ever since then. And, you know, it's been and gone, you know, as I went to university, you know, I did less gaming, but it's always been a big part of my life for sure. And do you, do you remember what some of the first games that really clicked with you were? Well, for me, it was all about the Commodore 64. It ah. was, it was my first, yeah, it was my first computer. And my, my uncle, um, literally, uh, handed handed down his Commodore 64 to me so as I said I was about eight or nine years old and um he just dumped it off um with my dad and I just got home one day and I remember it sitting in front of the telly this sort of beige box and I had no idea what it was you know I, I wasn't shown how to use it it just had a sort of a stack of games with it and I just it really was sounds corny but it really was love at first sight I mean I just really enjoyed messing around with it and, you know, mashing the keys because I was so young and didn't really know what I was doing on some games, but it was, it just felt so exciting. And uh, some of the games that I used to play, um, it only, I think he handed it down with sort of like five or six games. There was, um, there was a game called International Soccer, mm -hmm. which is a really famous early Commodore 64 game. Very, very basic soccer game, sort of left to right, very blocky graphics, but it, um, it's very sort of iconic at the time, sort of used to spend hours on that. And then another one that I used to play loads, it sounds really odd, was a was a Cold War simulator called Theatre Europe. I don't know if a nine-year-old should have been, um, it should have been, uh, you know, <laughs> setting off missiles and playing uh, sort of war strategies. But again, it just felt so, um, I don't know if it just felt so grown up and just so, like, it just, oh, it just felt so amazing. And... You know, I loved the graphics, I loved the cassettes, I loved the loading, I, everything about the Commodore 64 um, was just was just so magical. And then really it was a case of once once I was into it, I would get games for, um, you know, birthdays and Christmases. And I've got so many strong memories of family members giving me games for Christmas. And, you know, I can remember which family members gave which games, you know, from 1990. The memories are that etched into my brain so it's, yes a massive part of me actually and my childhood the Commodore 64 so it's um yeah as you could probably tell it's something i'm hugely passionate about yeah there were some great games that have have endured that i think got their first releases on that like um i mean i'm, I'm partial to the adventure genre i'm sure we'll, we'll we'll talk about that but i remember zach mccracken was on the commodore and maniac mansion two seminal uh the games in the adventure genre they were on the 64 commodore 64 um, that resonates a little bit with um, what you were saying about the Cold War game because I remember I went to for a couple of years I went to a private school and in the library they had a computer lab but they were a little bit behind the 
behind the times and they had the old black and white Mac computers, which people don't really think about uh, gaming on, although you have a book that would maybe argue a bit about that. Um, and we had Risk on there. And it was the first time I'd ever seen Risk. I was very young. And it, it the same kind of thing. It felt very uh, very grown up. You know, I'm conquering these other countries and moving yeah. forward <laughs> over the map in these little black and white graphics. Um, but it was fun, you know. You would sneak away uh, when you were supposed to be in class, go to the library and told the librarian caught you and said, you know, you're not supposed to be in here. <laughs> you would just sit and play Risk. Well, maybe let me ask you this. What, what Do you have a favorite system, uh, either a uh, console system or is uh, PC or Mac gaming? What's your favorite game when you do get the chance these days? Oh, these days, it's it's mainly because I don't really have anything old set. Well, I've, I've got one of those arcade cabinets with um, oh. all the games on them. But to be honest with you, with young children, it's quite hard to get the time. Yeah. A lot of the, yeah. you know, a lot of the time. So a lot of my gaming's done nowadays on the Switch because my okay. son is quite into gaming. So, you know, he's got the usual sort of Mario games, but I do tend to play, um, you know, games like Axiom Verge and sort of indie games on the Switch when I can. But yeah, I mean, the majority of my time, to be honest, is taken up um, designing books about games rather than actually playing them nowadays. Right, right. And then what was the system that kind of took up the most of your time when you were younger? How did you spend your time gaming? What what was the one that you really kind of developed your love for, for gaming on? Was it was it the Commodore or was there something that came after that that you fell in love with? Yeah, even? I was I was probably a bit, I was quite probably quite young on the Commodore. My memories on the Commodore were I mean, some of the games were quite basic um on that system. Obviously, um you mentioned a couple of games before like Zap McCracken and Maniac Mansion. I never actually played those on the Commodore. Um, we tended to have over in the UK a lot of budget games. So whereas sort of in the late 80s, I know in, in, in the US, you guys were paying sort of, well, I don't know how many dollars, but about over here for NES games, we were sort of paying 40 pounds. Um, wow. But budget Commodore 64 games were like two pounds. So, you know, five ah. bucks or something for a really, and you could get really cheap games. They sold them in sort of corner shops, like news agents. Um, so, you know, when you're really young and you don't have a lot of money, it was a really great way to play games. But as I said, some of them were quite, were quite um, basic. But I think for me, gaming really, I think it was the Commodore Amiga, which I, which I had after the Commodore 64 was where I really discovered um, I don't know the right way of saying it, sort of like bigger games or more involved games, like strategy games and point and click adventure games. And I suppose that's when I really started to sink a lot of a lot of time into it. You know, when it's spending summer days when I should be, should have been outside, inside trying to <laughs> solve a puzzle on Monkey Island, which I'm sure we've all been there. <laughs> oh yeah. What was your preferred gaming genre? Did you have one, or you kind of just all over the place? Whatever, whatever you came across. Yeah, a bit all over the place. Um, I've always been very drawn to football games. So I've, I've been a been a football fan myself, or soccer, as you call it over there. Um, but so games like Sensible Soccer, I'm really really big fan of, and some football management games. But I guess it would have to be point and click adventure games. I mean, on on the Amiga, it was the two Monkey Island games, and yeah, I had a bunch of them. And I mean, I used to play play those non-stop you know games like beneath the still sky um lure of the temptress they were just so immersive and that was really what took up the majority of my time but um because because i didn't have a hard drive on my amiga um i don't know what it was like in the states but um well i suppose with dos games you probably in, install them but yes. um over here we had to do disc swapping <laughs> so I think Monkey Island came on 11 discs, I think. I think Beneath the Still Sky came on 15 discs. Yeah, it was quite painful. So you'd literally move to a different room and it would say insert disc, you know, 12 or something. And then you have to insert it. It would have to cr it make this crunching noise. And then, um, you know, you'd sort of continue. Um, and if you were lucky, you'd have a second disc drive. So you could, you know, put discs one and two in and it would save a bit of time. But yeah it was um it was quite it was quite cumbersome looking back you know playing those games those 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 adventure games were so massive didn't feel like a massive drag at the time 
um, to be honest with you. Um, you know, like looking back, I suppose, but nowadays we're so spoiled, aren't we? Everything's so instant. Oh, you know, yeah. nowadays putting something on 15 discs, it wouldn't be, <laughs> it wouldn't, people wouldn't put up with that, would they? Yesterday, I spoke to Sai Mustache, uh, who works at uh, Phoenix Online Studios. She's a big fan of you guys also, and did some work with Sierra and LucasArts. And we were talking about how we're spoiled now because we, I did play some of those games where you had to switch the disc because, like I said, I started very, very young. And mm. we were talking about how, you know, I have a desire for people to return to making text parser games because I'm, I have such nostalgia for that that I actually got annoyed when point and click took over initially. Because I missed something of like the ability to just type whatever you wanted in and see what the reaction you would get was. Now, 99% of the time, it just said, you know, I don't understand this. Or, <laughs> or the, the classic yeah. uh, Sierra would say, you're too smart for this game. Um, but 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 so I was saying, you know, people just wouldn't have it now. <laughs> they just would they wouldn't no. deal with having to guess what to put in. And I, and I, and I guess that's true. Did you play many of those? Um, uh, pre point and click adventure games at all the ones where you like the early Sierra games where you actually had to type in what you wanted to do and hope that you were getting the verbs right uh, no I, I, I can't remember playing any early Sierra games because I said I was mainly Amiga I mean I think some of the early Sierra games did come onto the Amiga like Police Quest um, I think I'm, I, I, I do have memories of playing Police Quest definitely and, and there's Shoot Larry but I think because my dad had an office job and um, at the weekends he used to go in and do work. And so we used to, he used to turn on the PC and he used to let us, me and my sister sort of play games on it. Um, and I, I, I remember playing battle chess. I don't know if you remember that. That was an I do, amazing yeah. game. But mm -hmm. I used to love, love battle chess. I actually learned how to play chess. Playing that. Um, and I've, I have got memories of playing um, police quest. Definitely. Um, but again, I was quite young, so I don't know how I would have got around the sort of the text parser. Um, but earlier than that, I remember text adventure games on the Commodore 64. I had a game called Cebo Cebo Delta, which was um, which was a bit like the Abyss, sort of like an underwater um, sort of text adventure game. And I don't think I was ever really seriously playing i was probably just typing in swear words to be honest like <laughs> yeah. that. To be, um, my, my my love for adventure games definitely definitely started um with the sort of monkey island um that that point and click um you know click with the was just was something about it just clicked with me excuse the pun it just um <laughs> i loved that I, I loved that interface and yeah i mean yeah I, I can understand why people nowadays wouldn't wouldn't be able to handle a text parser. It just would just blow their mind. I think. <laughs> yeah, it, it it was it was actually very frustrating. Like, I don't think I fully fell in love with adventure games until Monkey Island itself, which remains one of my favorite games of all time. Um, but there was just something about like you know when you're really young, you have this naive idea that a game is going to come out where you can type in anything and the game will do it. You know, which yeah. never happened. And then you feel like when, when point and click takes over, I felt like, well, now that'll never happen because we're locked into these these icons. But then I, I very quickly fell fell in love with it. And like I said, Monkey Island well, there weren't icons in Monkey Island. There was um what you, it was like the verbs at the bottom of the screen. Yes. And yeah. um and that game was just something about the humor, first and foremost. I just thought it was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. Now, when I was very, very young, my sense of humor is probably mostly formed if 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 I could pick one thing by the Muppet Show. So it was already this kind of like absurd uh, <laughs> kind of style of humor that I was drawn to, and Monkey Island definitely fit in with that. And so I I loved it immediately. And then all the games that Lucas Arts did and that Sierra went on to do were just some of the biggest masterpieces of of all time. I would think. So how did now let's let's kind of jump back the other way. When did the idea for for Bitmap first come into was uh, was it your head? Was it your idea initially? Was it a collaborative process with others? No, no. So it was me. So as I said before, I was working as a as a graphic designer for various commercial clients and to be honest with you, I just got a bit bored. I was just doing work for clients and I didn't really, you know, things like financial institutions and like for example and it's just not really what i'm into and 
you know, it was decent design work, but it just wasn't really, um, you know, make, um, like fulfilling me creatively, creatively, um, I suppose is the right way of sort of phrasing it. Um, so I was f- feeling a little bit, um, stale, you know, creatively and around, so I was sort of looking for some sort of looking around for some creative projects, you know, what I could do. And at the time, another publisher had released a book, um, on, on the Sega Mega Drive. And I looked at this book and I was just like, wow, this is, you know, it's really nicely designed and it's on, you know, something which I'm really, really into, you know, and I couldn't believe that there was an audience for such a thing. And this is probably like back in 2013. Um, so, and I started looking into it more and sort of realized there was a few of these gaming books out there, but not all of them were, um, you know, saying this politely, you know, they, they didn't, they weren't, um, they weren't professionally designed, if you like, you know, they were very well written, um, you know, and passionate by created by passionate fans, but there wasn't that, um, that aesthetic, um, of like a coffee table book that I was particularly drawn to. So, you know, I started thinking to, my, thinking to myself, I'd love to do something like that myself. And it, it, na- it naturally was the Commodore 64. I thought that I'd want to do a book on, um, and I, started sort of brainstorming some ideas and came up with this idea that I'd love to do something visual, um, uh, very much focusing on the graphics of the Commodore 64, which is um, something which, which is massively um, I'm drawn to. And I came up with this, this, um, the idea of calling it a visual compendium. Mm. And that's really where it started. It was just me, you know, blank sheet of paper. I want to do this book. Um, used Kickstarter because I didn't have an audience. Um, I, you know, I didn't know if anybody would want this, um, this book. Um, so obviously Kickstarter is perfect because you can sort of test the water for, for an idea. And to answer your question, Bitmap Books was created really just as a bit of a, a publisher for the book, like a, a, like a company behind the book. I didn't actually create the company with any sort of grand plan to run a publishing company. It was just like a bit of a vehicle for this book. Um, and then obviously the book was really well received. We had over 900 backers and yeah, the business has just gone a bit crazy since then and just grown year on year. And I've sort of rolled with it and now it's, it's pretty much what I do full time now. So I sort of skipped forward a bit, sorry, but no, that's just great. sort of answer, it was a, I don't want to say it was an accident starting bitmap books because obviously it wasn't because I physically <laughs> thought the name and designed the logo, but I wasn't, it was more just having a bit of fun, you know, oh, this is cool. I'll design a logo for a publishing company. And then I didn't, you know, I wasn't taking it that seriously thinking it was going to be a thing. Um, so it's pretty amazing really what it has turned into. Yeah. And what about the, the choice to focus almost, almost exclusively on classic gaming was the, was that just born out of personal interest these are the games i'm interested yeah. in and so okay um and what kind of did, did you do some kind of um assessment of or, or, or was there a point where you thought to yourself yeah this is niche stuff i'm really into this but I, i'm not sure how successful it's going to be obviously like you said it's become incredibly successful but was there a point where you were where you were at all worried about it where you thought maybe well i'm not i'm not going to put out anything about these new games i'm going to focus on what i'm interested in and just hope that others are also interested in it. Um, was there ever any fears there of, of going so specific with, with the choices of what you would cover? Yeah. Um, and I think that's where Kickstarter or, or, or crowdfunding in general is great because you can test an idea and if there's not enough interest, then, you know, you've not lost anything. Um, so the first couple of books, the first book we did was on the Commodore 64, as I said, and that was, that was really popular. And then the, the Commodore Amiga book would just blew up massively. Um, after that, um, you know, it was just, it just went crazy. And then we did a book on the ZX Spectrum and it went mm-hmm. quite a lot lower. So, you know, it's not, not that we expected every book to sort of grow and grow and grow the, that we released, but I suppose that was an important lesson for me that, you know, not every, not everyone's going to buy every single book. 
I suppose, because obviously customers have got different interests, um, different systems they're into. So people sort of pick and choose, um, you know, which titles to get. So I suppose to answer your question, I've never really been worried um, because I think we don't use Kickstarter anymore, but I think, I mean, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm so into gaming and retro gaming and um, I keep a real close eye on social media and what people are sort of into and what does well and what doesn't do well. And so I think I've got quite a good idea of what, what, um, what books I can produce that are going to be popular enough to make viable. Does that kind and of make sense? It, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Um, and okay. you know, we, we've seen a real resurgence in, um, two of those genres i think that are my personal favorite the two books that i own so far from bitmap um and i hope to acquire many more but i have uh, as i mentioned i have the art of point and click adventure games and i have the crpg yes. book and we've we've really seen both of those genres come back now some people say they never died and and i might agree with that but we've seen a real resurgence in their popularity um how do you go about choosing now the subjects for each particular book is it is it is it something that's done by committee? Do you say you know this is a area that I've been interested in we haven't covered yet? Do you notice a trend in social media for something that um, is becoming popular? Interest is growing in, and you say okay, now we need to do a book about that. How does that kind of work? Kind of all of the above, really. Um, I think this. I suppose the two main ways are the first way is that we get approached by an author. So, for example. Um, we will get approached by, I mean, Dave um, Cook, who who was the author of Go Straight. He contacted us and said, um, hey, I really want to do a book on scrolling beat-em-ups. Would you like to publish it? And it's kind of as simple as that, really. So, you know, I'm like, yeah, great. Always wanted to do a book on scrolling beat-em-ups. You know, let's do it. So it's, it's really sort of as simple as that. And then the other way is me. Well, I suppose there's two other ways. One other way is me doing things that i want to do so the point and click book was really me wanting to do a book on point and click adventure games because it's one of my favorite genres of games and i'm like hey you know wouldn't it be cool to do a book on point and click adventure games i'd love to do that i'd love to design it so it's really a passion project um and then the other way is like you say sort of maybe spotting an opportunity um for like a genre maybe that's like super popular at the moment um that we can sort of um i don't like using the word like capitalize it's not the right word but you know like if we can see there's an opportunity to do a book on something and it's something that, that we want to do then you know great we'll do it i mean the good thing is is that bitmap books is just me i don't have any sort of business partners or any other sort of shareholders or anything it's very much an independent company oh, and the advantage okay. of that the advantage of that means that i can make my own decisions um you know i and i can yeah i don't have to you don't have to compromise <laughs> from anyone if you like yeah i don't have to compromise yeah, that's yeah what's way. um what's that saying uh, a camel is a horse designed by committee right so yeah, yeah if, you have, if you have a vision it's best best sometimes to just um be able to execute it um, on your own. And I, I have to tell you, so I, I have the point and click book in my hand right now, and it appeals on so many levels. It's first of all, these books are, are so beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful. I mean, they're, they're pieces of art in themselves. They really are. I can't for anyone that hasn't seen a bitmap book in person, I mean, even the pictures on the website, though, they're excellent pictures. They don't do it justice. You need to get and hold and look through one of these books. And anyone that is a gamer in any sense, there's going to be something that Bitmap covers that you're interested in. Um, go to the website and check it out. But the point and click book, just as an example, because as I said, it's, it's my favorite genre probably of all time. And I, and I have it right here in front of me. It's so beautiful. I mean, these, these two page spreads of pixel art from these games. So first of all, not only is the appeal nostalgic, which of course it is for someone like me and, and you that have lived through that era and played a lot of those games. But also, um, the appeal is aesthetic. I mean, a lot of these these pixel graphics, and we, we've seen it in how much they've come back recently. It's really a beautiful kind of art form, and I think that oh, yeah. anyone that argues that games are not art just needs to again take a look through one of these bitmap books, and their mind should be changed if they're intellectually honest at all. Um, and also, what I like about it, and I wonder if um, if you you've heard this before, and if so, how much? What I really like is it's 
it's useful kind of as a tool because obviously when a lot of these games were coming out, the internet wasn't a thing. So it's not like you could, the things you can do now would just go online and scroll through Steam in a certain um, genre and find some hidden gems. Uh, you, you just kind of had to stumble across things in the store or your friend recommended a game to you. So what I love about the bitmap books, especially um, the adventure game one and the CRPG one, is that there are games I never heard of, but that looked really interesting. And because the write-ups and everything are so detailed in the books, I can then go, oh, this looks really cool. Now I can go try and find that online. Check that out. Um, is that something that people have, have uh, given you as feedback too? Like, oh, wow, this is not only a, a book for things I already love and enjoy, but it allows me to discover new things I will go on to enjoy. Yeah, I mean, that's that's amazing to hear that people do that. And it has that, you know, the book has the power to, you know, people can discover new games. Yeah, it is something we hear often. We also hear um, people sort of people are, who are learning to do pixel art or they might work at a games agency um they buy the books for like reference so if they're you know for designing a game they might use it for to look at what's what's already out there so yeah it's 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 so nice that the books aren't just picture books that people sort of flip through you know they're, they're actually got substance to them and people are getting Real get substance, more out yeah. of them yeah is 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 fantastic as a as a publisher and stuff it's lovely to hear that so being that that's the case that they are incredibly substantive and, and well researched about how long and i'm sure it varies um but about how long from from uh, inception to actual publishing does it take for you to create one of these books yeah as you said it varies i think if i remember rightly the point and click book probably took about a year from from initial idea from me having the idea and then sort of playing around with the design templates and then obviously the huge job of interviewing all of the all of the guys and girls inside the book probably takes mm -hmm. about a year and then it then print production only takes about three months so it's yeah it's quite a long process it, um, it's quite strange actually because you know, it does take so long that by the time a new book is coming out, I'm already sort of like moved on to the next project. So right. it's quite a strange, quite a strange sort of thing that's, you know, you sort of forget about something and then suddenly it's like, oh, wow, look at that. It's amazing. You know, it's, uh, it's quite nice. <laughs> How do you land some of these interviews, honestly? Because, you know, obviously as someone who traffics and interviews myself, I mean, you've got the big dogs in, in, in the point and click book, for example, I'm just going to, you know, drop some of the big names. You get Al Lowe. You've got Corey and Lori Cole of, you know, Quest for Glory fame, Dave Gibbons. Um, you've got Ron Gilbert, Tim Schafer. I mean, these are these are the big dogs of adventure gaming. Um, and, I'm, you know, I'm leaving a bunch up, but there's a ton of them in there. How, how do you go about doing that? Especially, um, you know, like you said, you're an independent company. It's not like uh, you have, you know, Lucas or Disney backing you, something like that. Is, is, are most of these people just, just good natured and receptive to doing interviews with you? Or how do you kind of, without giving away, you know, insider secrets, how do you go about kind of landing some yeah. of these interviews? Well, um, I, f I should probably mention, so when we first started, obviously with the Commodore 64 book, we were, no, nobody had heard of bitmap books and it was very hard for us to get any sort of interviews at that point. And I was very, very lucky because a good friend of mine called um, Andy Roberts is very well, um, he's worked within the Commodore 64 um, scene um, in journalism and making games also. He was really kind to introduce us to, well, he basically um, put his name behind, you know, said, you should speak to Bitmap Books. They're good guys. Um, and we managed to get a couple of interviews that way. And all that's happened is every time we do a new book, because we can sort of ref we can say, hey, would you like to be interviewed? In the past, we've interviewed these guys. Here's an example. We've published X amount of books. You know, we've worked with SNK. We've worked with Sega. And I think just little things like that reassure people um, and makes them think, well, you know, if so-and-so has been interviewed, then, you know, then they must be good guys. So it really is just a case of getting that lucky break where you can get a couple of good interviews and then just sort of it snowballs after that. Some people are just really, really lovely and are really happy to talk because, you know, they're obviously, you know, this is their legacy and, you know, I know it's a horrible thing to say, but these people aren't going to be around for forever. And it's important that they, they get their, 
their story down, whether it's in books or podcasts or you know interviews online. You know, some people understand that it's really important that we do this now. That's a really important, excellent point. And um, you know, gaming is and for a long time has been bigger than film. Uh, it's definitely bigger than uh, other forms of of art. Um, and it's it's the only form of art that's truly interactive. And I think the people that create these things are important. They are important creators. I don't know why sometimes things like video games and, and comic books get looked down on. They, they shouldn't be. It's just art that incorporates visuals. And in the instance of gaming, like I said, it's it's also incorporates interactivity. You get real feedback from something like that. So it's another thing that makes these books so important because it tells these people's stories, allows them to tell their stories. Um, but speaking of people and um, their creations, how hard is it? Do you need to, because I'm, I'm very ignorant about uh, this kind of thing. Do you need to get the rights for all of these games in order to put them in the book and if so how difficult is that and um you don't have to mention names but has anyone or any creator or any company said no we don't want our work included in in this book so it's a mixture really so we do a mixture of unofficial and official books so we've worked with um, on the official side in the past we've worked with sega where we we made a book on the sega master system and we've worked with atari to produce um a book on the uh, 2600 and 7800 um we've also been really really lucky to work with snk which is just which was just it's just absolutely amazing to work with them and we've done books on the neo geo metal slug and the king of fighters um so that's the official sort of side of things and then we do um unofficial books as well um on 99 of the time it's absolutely fine um, doing unofficial books. Um, we have had issues before, um, particularly one with Nintendo back in 2000, mm. I think it was 2016, yeah, where we where we um, ran a Kickstarter for um, a NES Famicom visual compendium and uh, the Kickstarter got paused because um, there was, I basically made some really schoolboy errors um, around using their, um, their gold seal you know their yeah. classic you know stamp logo right. where i sort of did like a bit of a pastiche of it and put bitmap books in the middle of it and you know looking back it was just a really stupid dumb thing to do because <laughs> you know um, yeah. it, uh, obviously their their issue was that if someone took a quick glance at it it could look like it was a nintendo official product so you know i sort of i was very very lucky um and i'll always be um so grateful to nintendo that they um, gave me the time of day and listened to me and gave me the opportunity to fix what was wrong. And then we could, then we could, um, yeah, press play on the Kickstarter again. But it was, um, it was quite, a, um, I remember when it happened, it was like 11 o'clock at night or something. Someone texted me and said, Hey, your Kickstarter has been taken down or something. And it was, um, quite, quite stressful, but I think I learned an important lesson, um, with that and, you know, touch wood. We've not had any issues since um, like that. So, yeah. Yeah, people people kind of give Nintendo a lot of heat online for being overly protective of their brand, but that's kind of how you remain Nintendo for so long and are able to have those standards that you have is you, you have to be protective. What do you see as the main differences between very modern gaming and classic and vintage gaming? I think for me... Classic gaming is a much more pick up and play. So you can boot up Street Fighter 2 and you're playing within 10 seconds. Um, that's how I remember gaming. My issue with a lot of modern gaming is, and I don't do a lot of modern gaming, like modern, modern, like AAA sort of titles, but yeah. you have to, you know, the, you have to watch tutorials and you have to get into it and there's a lot of in intro stuff and you know there's you have to invest a lot of time into those games mm -hmm. um and obviously they're hugely rewarding you know once, once you've once you're into it but that's the main thing for me i just i just much prefer classic gaming it's much more pick it up have a quick 10 minutes put it down again and much i just don't have the time to sink five hours or eight hours into a, into a game. Um, I just, you know, it's just not possible for me. So that's pro probably, that's probably the answer for, me, for that. Do you think that um, modern gaming's kind of 
tunnel vision approach to graphics, going full speed towards realism as much as possible is a mistake. And you think that that is what kind of kickstarted the resurgence of pixel art? Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, one of the biggest things I find is a shame nowadays. Um, so if, if you remember when we were kids, I, um, I don't know if you had this in America, but in, in the UK, on the back of early um, early games like the Amiga and the Commodore, on the back it would have different screenshots for the different systems. So if it was a yes. game on the back, it would say, this is the ZX Spectrum screenshot, Commodore 64. And there was so much difference within the different, um, across the screenshots, wildly different games, wildly different visuals. And that's what I think a big shame nowadays is that I can't tell the difference between an Xbox game and a PlayStation game. It just all looks the same to me. Um, and I just think that's a real shame that you don't get that difference because that was a big thing for me back then. So what was the second part of the question? I was saying, do you think that that contributed at all to the resurgence of things like pixel art? Oh yeah, um, sorry. No, it's okay. That there's something maybe um, again. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not a programmer or designer by any means, but just from an outsider perspective, aesthetically, it seems like in some ways things like pixel art are more flexible. You can somehow get a wider range of style with something like pixel art than you can with with realism, hyper realism, because that's just going to look hyper realistic. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, again, I'm not a programmer like you, so I don't know. I mean, I do know that pixel art takes a lot of time to produce. So I think if a game decides to go full on pixel, then yeah, they're, they're signing up to, you know, a lot of development, I believe. Um, I think, I think a lot of the time it's probably to appeal sort of nostalgic, I would have thought, isn't it? So yeah. a lot of the games, you know, they're, they're obviously riffing on Castlevania or Metroid or something. They're trying to appeal to people who loved that game back in the day to buy their new indie game, I would have thought. I think that's probably, you know, one of the main motivators. Like, for instance, the new um, the new Turtles game, which we've got, I bought for my son for Christmas on the Switch, which is which is great fun, really, really great fun. But it's obviously, you know, massively referencing the Turtles arcade game, isn't it? Yeah, it definitely calls back to that. It's it, that's a great game. I have that too. That, that's a game that even my wife will play with me, and she is not she is not a gamer, but she remembers the days of you know, Ninja, <laughs> Ninja Turtles, cool. watching Ninja Turtles with her brothers, and, and that game being in the arcade. So I can get her to actually play that one. Um, well, of course, it's called yeah. Hero Turtles over here. We weren't allowed to use the word ninja. <laughs> oh, I remember hearing something like that. Yeah, it's it's not well, still it's not still the case, is it? Oh, I don't know. There's a new film coming out soon. Actually, we saw a trailer for it when we when we t I took my son to see the Mario film, and they had a trailer for the um, for this new Turtles film. I can't remember actually. No, yeah, it probably is Ninja now because you have the word Ninja everywhere nowadays, don't you? Yeah, oh, yeah, you, you get a lot of words everywhere now. But it's just it's just some strange censorship that I don't understand why ninjas was such a bad word in the U in, in the uk back then but anyway yeah um but before we do run out of time there's a couple other things i want to ask you about and one of them is the two books that i perceive to be kind of outliers in the catalog so there's the micro machines book yes. and there's hg wells war of the worlds illustrated how did how did those come about uh, again are these just personal interests of yours and you said well what the heck i have the means to to do these let's do them or uh was it something else it really, it really, it just sounds like a really bad business sort of way of working, but the, the War of the Worlds is really just a passion project of mine. I mean, I, I've always been really into that story, particularly the Jeff Wayne musical. And I just thought to myself one day, as I do, as I was walking home from work, hey, wouldn't it be great if, you know, there was like a, almost like a graphic novel of that, but in as like a coffee table book with the original um, H.G. Wells text in there. And yeah, that was kind of it really. Um, I, I had a really good relationship with the artist um, who, who, who did all the artwork in that book. And we decided to sort of collaborate and produce it. So um, it, it was really a stab in the dark, that one. Um, it was just a passion project. And it was a bit of a test in the water, sort of moving away, not, not, not moving away from gaming books but just trying to do a few other things and then off the back of that 
while I was while I was thinking of ideas, um, I think I saw I, I came across um, Tim's website on um, called Micro But Many, which basically showcased his collection of micro machines and just the way my brain works i just instantly thought wow that would make an awesome book you know i can imagine um you know these beautiful tiny little cars blown up with these really high resolution photos in a book would be something pretty special and that's kind of the way it happens you know i have an idea and just sort of make it happen <laughs> in terms of the micro machines book anyway it it kind of fits because you know classic toys and collectibles definitely go along with classic gaming um yeah do you have any more plans or ideas that, that you could reveal to do things in either of those directions again are there any other novels or 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 um toy lines that you say to yourself hey, that would make a good bitmap book not not um i haven't got any plans for any other graphic novels um but i did get contacted by someone recently um about potentially doing a toy book so but action figures so something similar to micro but many but action figures so that's something which we're considering at the moment potentially but i think that mm. could be really cool that would be really cool and in, in the bitmap style it would be amazing um yes now i know that this is gonna be like asking you to pick between your children but do you have a personal favorite bitmap book uh, i'm gonna exclude commodore 64 book because i think that's a that is a bit of a that will always have a special place in my heart because it was the first, the first one. But I think looking at if I, looking at them as you know books and things that I'm really really proud of um, how they've turned out. I think I'd probably say the King either 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 the King of Fighters book or the Metal Slug book. I think probably let's let's say King of Fighters. I think work, working with SNK which has just been amazing. They totally get books and they, you know, they bend over backwards to help to produce the books because, you know, they get it, you know, it, it helps promote their games and they trust Bitmap to present those, their IP um, in, in the correct way. And they know that, that we'll kind of do that. Um, but there was quite a lot of pressure looking back on, working with the king of fighters because it really is their flagship ip you know right. me metal slug's important but king of fighters is their main one so i was really trusted a lot and i didn't feel it at the time but there was quite a lot of pressure to you know really knock it out of the park and i did that book during lockdown and and it was it was just so much fun to put together and i just think that you know, the level of detail in it, the mixture of visuals and text, um, the fact that we, um, through our research, we um, found out that before, um, when uh, King of Fighters was um, like its first iteration, it was like a final fight sort of scrolling beat em up, but it was going to be four player. Um, and the, the bosses at SNK didn't like the idea um, and then it, then the, the, the developers said, okay, we'll take the, the sort of the, the two on two um, sort of concept and we'll apply it to like a fighting game instead. And I, I didn't know that story before. And we managed to speak to the original developers and wow, it's just, I just think that book's just got, it's just got a bit of, a bit of everything for me. It's, it's informative. It's, it's, um, it's beautiful to look at and, yeah, uh, I think, you know, my opinion might change next week, but at the moment, I'd probably say the King of Fighters of history is my favorite. Yeah, that's 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 a good choice. I can't argue with that. I remember <laughs> um, when I was young, we would go to the laundromat, and um, this one laundromat still had one of the old uh, Neo Geo, SNK Neo Geo, like multi-choice arcade cabinets, and I would just uh, pour quarters into yeah, I would just pour quarters into Metal Slug and, and King of Fighters games for like the hours <laughs> that we were there washing our laundry. And I loved it. I fell in love with um, with both of those series at that point. I mean, the pixel art on those games is just... Amazing. Uh, I, 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 honestly, it is, it is art. The, the amount of frames of animation that obviously, the, you know, you could have on the Neo Geo and the, the, the resolution and stuff, it's just like even like King of Fighters, all the different fighting moves and all the different 
um, all the clothes that you know the clothes that the, 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 that they're wearing and everything. It's just it's just unbelievable. I think you know, and the fact that they you know that they were producing one King of Fighters game a year is just unbelievable. Really, it's really impressive. So yeah. I just take, take take my hat off to these to anyone who 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 who, who made a video game back then particularly because obviously you know they didn't have photoshop and stuff necessarily it was a lot more um, basic the tools they were using really well amazing. i take my hat off to you for doing such an incredible job in showcasing these games and their artwork in bitmap books which are I, you know i can't state it enough i mean the, the books are beautiful and i can tell that you um hold yourself to a very very high standard when you're producing them because um they're impeccably designed um incredibly well compiled thorough thorough comprehensive like i said the interviews in them are amazing um and anyone that is uh, even a, a, a slight fan of anything classic gaming should really head over to the website and and give it a look and buy buy a couple of your books um is there anything you can tell us about plans going forward and then finally before i let you go is there anything else that you would want the listeners to know about where they can find you or any other projects you have in the works yeah so projects we've got there's a few that i can't mention obviously i'm not trying right. to be secretive just because <laughs> you know they're um of like confidentiality agreements and stuff but we've got a um coming up in the next few weeks so i think it's probably going to be the start of june we've got uh, our next book coming out which is called pc engine the box art collection so those of those that know um uh, we we've already created two box art collection books before one on the super famicom and one on the game boy so with this version we've we've photographed we've worked with a collector of pc engine japanese games and we've professionally photographed um about 150 of the of the covers of the games and then we've wow. presented them in this book and each one is each one is reviewed and there's screenshots as well for each game and then we've got um there's like a, a history of the pc engine at the start and we've interviewed the collector um whose games they were um so that's a really really exciting project which yeah it's been a been in development for a long long time that one but that's coming out at the start of june um in the summer we've got oh, you mentioned the crpg book earlier we've mm. we've we've worked with the author to make um an expanded version of that book so philippe has added an extra 150 pages to what was already a pretty big book he's now added 150 pages to that um, and he's added in some extra games that were missed out. He's added in um, sections on Korean and Chinese CRPGs. And he's added in like a box art gallery as well. So loads of new content in that. So that's that's coming out in the summer. And then I don't think I've announced this anywhere, but we, we've got a project coming out in the summer, which I can't mention. But in um, towards the end of the year, we've, we're going to be releasing a, a book on horror video games. And that one has just gone to print. Well, sorry, no, hanging on to print. It's at the proofreaders at the moment. It's going to print very soon. But um, yeah, that's a that's a that's an exclusive. That's that's that, that's that's going to be coming out in um, in October. We're actually aiming for a Halloween release for that one. Do you have a title so, for that book that you could give us, or is it secret? It's called From Ants to Zombies, from A to Z. So ADF, From Ants to Zombies, and it's um, like six decades six decades of video game horror it's actually really interesting what we've done because i think it sort of go it sort of goes back to how we approach doing doing books i didn't want to fall into a trap of just doing you know here are the horror games from 1980 here are the horror games from 1981 and you know so on and so forth the the author has arranged the um, the games like thematically so there'll be um space horror games there'll be um underwater horror so he's grouped the games in a really interesting way i think and it's uh yeah i'm really really excited about it and i'm 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 hoping that it's going to be um something that everyone's gonna everyone's gonna dig that all sounds really exciting i'll definitely be on the lookout for that horror gaming book that sounds amazing um sam thank you so much i know i know i need to let you go uh i hope you will come back though you've only scratched the surface of um my interest in these games and uh 
you're definitely someone that I'm sure I could talk to for hours about classic gaming and adventure gaming and about Bitmap Books. So thanks again. Yeah, I'd love to, Chris. Yeah, I'd love to come on again. Um, thanks ever so much for having me. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Absolutely my pleasure. And again, anyone listening should go to bitmapbooks.com. All links to uh, that site as well as social media where you can follow Bitmap Books will be in the description of this podcast. Thank you again. Yeah.